Andrew, micronutrient deficiency is still something uh, which is very common, in particular in develop, developing countries. Do we know enough about deficiencies in specific regions? Is there enough research done? Or are there gaps? I think we probably know sufficient about the global distribution of micronutrient deficiencies, or at least of the leading micronutrient deficiencies that are generally associated with poor health outcomes, to get on with the job and to say, you know, we know that in these certain areas there's going to be a high prevalence of vitamin A deficiency or iron deficiency anemia, and, and, and the task is one of implementing the known interventions. But I think the area you're perhaps alluding to is what is the linkage between those micronutrient interventions and the health outcomes? Do we understand that dynamic well? And I think the surprising answer there is that in many cases we don't. So for instance with vitamin A, we, we know that there is a, a strong association between vitamin A supplementation of children and saving them from dying, but we don't know the mechanism of that. And you may say, well, it doesn't matter as long as it does the job. We don't need to know the mechanism. But where it may matter is that we could do the job even better if we understood the precision of that mechanism. Why is this research not done properly? Or is there not enough invested in this? Or are doctors not interested? Is, are there more attractive research fields? Well, I think one of the issues is that it is so immensely complicated. If you think of the number of micronutrients we have, which traditionally we'd think of as around 28 or so essential micronutrients, and then you factor that onto the number of different components of the immune system or the number of different diseases that people would be interested in, then it, it's just an immensely complex matrix that um, unfortunately we haven't had the research dollars to fill all the bits of that puzzle. So there are some really outstanding bits of the puzzle. Now we'll never be able to afford to fill all those bits, so we have to concentrate our research efforts on the ones that are most critical. And one of those that's emerging at the moment is the issue of iron deficiency. And the reason that's coming up to the top of the pile is that we know that iron deficiency anemia is highly prevalent in both children and pregnant mothers in low-income countries. But we also know that um, whereas you would think it would be a sim simple matter to give iron because iron is very, very cheap, it's easy to distribute, we also know unfortunately that that can be associated with some adverse outcomes. So there's a, a strong imperative at the moment to try and understand what's going on. Why does iron increase disease outcomes in, in children or indeed in pregnant mothers? Would you, would you say that iron is given in an uncritical way sometimes? Oh, very definitely. I think in the past, I think suddenly we're becoming much more uh, sophisticated in our thinking about it. The key problem is that iron feeds the pathogenic bacteria as much as it feeds the human, the human host. And it's this battle between the host and our pathogens that is causing this issue. Another issue here is this, that there, are, there is a whole spectrum of possible supplements we can use to uh, combat iron deficiency. Some of these are very sophisticated, but unfortunately there's an inverse relationship between the cost, or there's an, a direct association between the cost and the sophistication. So the supplements we tend to use for low-income countries, by definition, have to be very unphysiologic. We just sort of give iron sulfate or fumarate, and it's very quickly absorbed in a non-physiological way, and we think that's part of why there is a problem occurring. So iron is the most burning question, you would say? Well, I would say that iron is the biggest conundrum at the moment. I think the others are, you know, there are, contr there are controversies in terms of vitamin A. There are controversies as to how important zinc is. I think there are a few controversies over iodine. But iron is the one that's controversial at the moment because we're coming up with a, a, a slew of studies which are showing potential adverse effects. So I would recommend uh, the lecture which you have on the Nestle Nutrition Institute website on 
iron supplementation biomarkers indicating proper iron supplementation. Uh, biomarkers uh, for adequate iron status is something where you're very interested in. Indeed. So the, we're, we're very excited by, by the fact that we have, uh, not we, but others have recently discovered this new hormone, hepcidin, which is the master regulator of iron metabolism. So hepcidin is to iron what insulin is to glucose regulation. And it's a wonderful molecule because it seems to be able to sense at one and the same time how much iron the body needs and whether it is in danger of infection by giving that iron. So it, it acts as a gatekeeper. It tells us when the body is safe and ready to receive iron. Hepcidin is, uh, can it done from blood or? Yeah, so hepcidin is a small peptide hormone produced by the liver and it's under regulation, the complex pathways of regulation, but essentially if you're iron deficient then hepcidin is switched off and that allows iron to be absorbed from the intestine and vice versa. If you're iron overloaded then hepcidin will be switched on and it will basically cut off the absorption of iron in the intestine. So you just take a drop of blood and you, you take a drop of hepcidin. blood. We're, we're hopeful that in the future we might even be able to do it on a saliva test and you measure the hepcidin. And, and my, my sort of space age vision would be that we can um, develop this onto just a very cheap paper-based diagnostic chip. And it would almost be that you, know, you could have your iron tablet encapsulated within the test itself. So you know, the space age vision would be that someone could take their tablet, lick the, lick the um, packaging that it's in, and if it turns red, they take their tablet, for instance. If not, they throw the tablet away. Uh, that would be the ultimate vision. And final question, is the test standardized for all age groups? Not yet. We've got a great deal of work to do. The, the work we've done so far would, is very encouraging. It suggests that hepcidin will be the best biomarker for iron deficiency and for what we're calling safe and ready to receive iron. And, and encouragingly, it can do this over quite a wide range of hepcidin. So if we can develop it into a paper-based diagnostic, that diagnostic doesn't have to be fantastically precise. It, it's, kind of, it's a yes-no answer. Uh, is it even valid in premature infants? Do you know? We have no idea. I have no idea as to whether it, it would be valid in premature infants, but that's, that's work here that the could be done. appropriate iron supply is very critical. You know? Indeed, indeed. That's work that could be done and I would say should be done. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure.